I wish that I had embraced dependency inversion when I was just a beginner. All of the other solid principles seem to naturally fall into place when you write code with this one principle in mind. Today, we're gonna to talk about the what, the why, and the how of the D in solid. The best way to go about this is by walking through an example. Before we get to that, all solid principles are about writing code in such a way that you can easily change one part without affecting others. So what is dependency inversion? It means that when one module depends on another module, it should depend on an abstraction, an interface or abstract class, and not on a concrete implementation. Ideally, the concrete implementation will be provided from outside the module that needs it. But what does that look like? Let's look at some code where there is no dependency inversion. Today, let's create the beginnings of an ability system for our hero so that we can clearly illustrate dependency inversion by example. Every ability in the game will be defined by some ability data. We'll be able to do that in Unity using scriptable objects. We could then add all of the abilities we want for our hero to a list. Next, we can define an ability system class that will be responsible for using that data. The most naive implementation would be to pass in the data for an ability when we want to use it. In the start method, we can simply say that we want to create a new ability system. Now let's suppose that in our game we have many types of entities that can all use abilities. They all need their own ability system that's configured just for them. So this could be our enemy class, it could be other NPC characters, or even inanimate objects. So the way that we have this set up right now creates a few problems. We are very tightly coupled to the ability system. If I don't want to use this ability system class anymore, I cannot use a different class without changing every other class that uses it. I can't replace it with another type at runtime or during tests. The first thing we want to do to start decoupling here is to introduce an abstraction. I'm going to introduce a new interface called iAbilitySystem. I'm going to use Rider to extract an interface here, but you can do it manually if you needed to. Now, instead of storing my ability system as an ability system type, I can store it as a type of the abstraction, meaning I can use any ability system I want as long as it implements the interface. So congratulations, that's it. That's what the D means in solid. We've changed from programming to a concrete type to an abstraction. Now, how can implementing this change help us decouple the systems in our project? Maybe two months down the road, I decide I want a better ability system. So I make a new system. I call it improved ability system. And now I can actually just, wherever I was saying new ability system, I can just say new improved ability system. Now you might be able to find and replace all these instances but it's still manual work and it's still prone to human error. You could also introduce a setter method, but you still need some system outside of this class to remember all of the classes that need an ability system and then call this method on every single one when you're starting up your game. Now, another approach, which is certainly valid, would be to make your ability system a serializable field. And then you could do, you know, a form of drag and drop injection, really. But you have to do this for every single mono behavior in your game in every single scene. You also need to have a tool like Odin if you want to serialize interfaces or roll your own. I'm just going to clean this up a bit and move some classes into their own files. Now, these ways of changing your ability system are all valid. There's nothing wrong with them. They're all functionally correct and perfectly acceptable for small projects, even some bigger projects. However, as your project grows, being able to replace this ability system is going to become much more difficult. So the next natural step in the evolution of decoupling your objects would be to introduce a factory. Now factory would be the source of your ability system. All of your classes that need an ability system don't need to know about the ability system per se. They can just get it from the factory. Now the factory could also be a singleton or it could be maybe a static class. So now when you want to change your ability system, you only change it in one place in the factory. For example, if we come back to our hero and we can now call our singleton instance and simply ask it to create an ability system for us and we'll get the ability system we want to use. Now, this is a big improvement and we only have to change one line of code to introduce a new ability system across our whole game. Our hero class and any other class that needs this service only needs to know about the factory that provides it. Well, let's take this a little bit further. What if you have many services that you need to provide not just an ability system. You also have an inventory system, dialogue system, quest system, and so on. So instead of having multiple sources to go and fetch these systems from, 
or one godlike system that supplies everything and has a hundred methods in it, we might want to build a system where we can request a particular dependency by type. And this is called a service locator. Uh, service locator was the subject of a video a few weeks ago, and I'll put a link to that. So using a service locator, I can register my ability system factory as a service that I can simply request at any time. So we could define a variable here to hold it and get it from the service locator, then use it to create our ability system. But I can inline this so that I don't even need to keep a reference to the factory. I just get the factory and use its method. Now I have the system I want for this particular class. All in all, this reduces dependencies in your code. But now all of your code still has one dependency to the central single service locator. Dependency injection will take this one step further. We won't have to reference a service locator or any other provider. We just use an attribute to mark the dependency. I will simplify our code a bit. And back in the dependency itself, we can remove this awake method. We no longer have to register this dependency. Instead, we'll use the provide attribute and simply return this. That way, when the injection system runs, our dependencies will be satisfied by the system. There are lots of dependency injection systems out there for Unity, and in this example, I'm just using the one that we built last week. I'll have a link to that video as well. So all these methods are valid ways of decoupling the modules in your project. They only differ in complexity and implementation. We went from looking at tightly coupled code to very decoupled code. The less coupled the modules are in your game, the easier they facilitate change. Let's quickly recap the dependency inversion principle. Dependency inversion means that high-level modules should not depend on low-level modules. They should depend on abstractions. In our example, that means the hero does not depend on the ability system class. Instead, it depends on the iAbility system interface. The abstraction could be an interface, or it could also be an abstract base class, for example. Now, how you choose to satisfy the dependencies is up to you. We've just run through many ways to do it. All of those were valid ways to satisfy dependencies. And there are even more methods than the ones I just demonstrated. The method that you choose for your project is totally up to you. Well, why don't we round out this ability system a little bit? For the next minute or so, I'm going to expand on this ability system just as a demonstration of how you would start to break up an ability system instead of being a huge monolithic class that handles every possible situation into dependencies that are actually usable. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be using the command pattern to handle execution of all these abilities. So I'll break out an interface and then create a class called ability command that simply, you know, for now, all it's going to do is execute the ability, but it's really just going to put out a debug statement. If we come back to our ability system, I'm going to totally change this interface to be able to have a public property with all the commands that I've created. We want to be able to add, remove commands. We might be able to swap them positions in the list. That might be important for some cases. We might want to execute a particular command at an index. And let's just have a debug as well that we can just maybe output what commands are in here or some other behavior. Now we have to actually implement this interface and Copilot already has a pretty good guess of what I want to do. Almost there actually. So I actually have an extension method that I can use for swapping. So I'm just going to use that. I'll actually link to that in the description as well because I've added some more extensions to the repo. Now in the debug, I have another extension method actually. If, if the list is null or empty, let's just debug something and get out of there. Otherwise we'll print all the commands. Now, in an ability system, I would put a private constructor here because I don't want people just saying new ability system wherever. I want to build it and enforce some constraints. So let's just make a very simple builder here. The builder will require to pass in an entity. Now, that could be the enemy, the hero, or some other entity in the game. And then it'll have a few builder methods. Eventually, it will construct it by creating new ability commands with each ability. With that done, we can return our ability system. If we come back over to our factory, our factory now needs to receive whatever information the entity had. So it's a reference to the entity, maybe our hero and all of the hero's abilities. Then it can just use the builder to actually construct our ability system and bring it back. So there's still a bit of work to do with this system. I haven't defined any scriptable objects which define the abilities. And I haven't elaborated on the command class to actually do something with that data. But I hope that this serves as kind of a small but practical example of how you would start decoupling everything in your game and how you would start using programming patterns to actually help you do that. Now, 
While we're here, let's improve our dependency injection. Right now, we can't see the ability system factory, and we can't assign one manually either. Let's change that. What would be really cool is if we could show a little icon beside every field that's being injected and maybe change its color once it's been injected or has the dependency satisfied. So to do that, we can just create a custom property drawer for anything that has the inject attribute. But in order to use this, we actually have to make a change to the injector class. We have to change from using the base attribute to using a property attribute. So if I come over here to the inject attribute definition, I can just change it to be a property attribute and I can do the same thing for the provide attribute in case we want to do anything with that in the future as well. So this dependency injection system we built in the last video, I'll put a link to that up on the screen if you need to get up to speed on that. Let's come back over here to the property drawer. Now what I want to do is show an icon. So let's store that in a field here. Let's see what Copilot will suggest for an implementation. Okay, that's not bad, but I don't actually want to use a built-in icon. I already have an icon that I've got as a PNG. And it almost guessed the uh, location correctly too, actually. <laughs> um, so there it is correct. It's, uh, I put it in the editor folder and it's just called icon. Now, let's override the on GUI method. And I'm going to pass in the position, the property of this attribute, and its label. Again, Copilot had a pretty good implementation there, but what I actually want to do is change the color and I want to be very specific about the size because I sized it kind of too big. So what I'll do is change it to be the size of 20 by 20 and we'll just shuffle the whole position over by 24. That'll give us a bit of room. Now, as long as there is an icon, let's save the color that we're currently using. Then let's set the color based on whether or not the property is null or has a value. So we can use the object reference value. Let's say if the value is null, we'll use our saved color, which is probably white. Otherwise we'll turn it green. We'll draw our icon. We'll reset the color back to the saved color, and then let's actually draw our property field. I'm going to rename this icon field just to be icon because we don't need multiple references here and fix that up. And it looks pretty good. Now, if we come back over to our hero, we can actually add the serialized field attribute here, and that'll let us see it in the inspector. It's also going to let us set it in the inspector. So let's come over to the injector and let's say when we're going to inject into fields, we can just check to see if this particular field has a value. Let's skip it. Let's log a message if that's the case and then just continue. Let's go have a look. So there we go. We've got a nice icon right beside the field. If I press play, it does indeed turn green and we can see that the dependency has been satisfied by the system. So again, we covered all the ins and outs of this dependency injection system in the previous video, and I'll leave a link to that in the description as well. So I can think of one more improvement that I'd like to do that'll only take a couple minutes, and that is to create a custom editor for our injector. Since we might be dragging and dropping in different dependencies, you know, for testing and whatnot, we might want a button where we can just clear them all out. We might also want a button where we could validate that all of the injectable dependencies actually have a matching provider. So this will be a very simple custom editor. We'll draw the default inspector, we'll get the target, and we'll just store it as type injector. And then we can just have two buttons. Each button will call a method on the injector class. One will validate the dependencies, and the other one could be just to clear the dependencies. Now, when we clear the dependencies, let's also set dirty so that any changes that we make will be serialized. Now, in our injector class, let's start with the simplest one first, which would just be to clear all the fields. In fact, this method is going to be so simple, I bet you Copilot will fill it out correctly the first time here. Let's have a look. Let's give it a head start, a little hint. Yep, yeah, that looks pretty good. I'll just tab complete here. And let's have a read. So basically, we're going to iterate over all the mono behaviors in the scene. If we find any that have the inject attribute, we are simply going to set the value to null. So next, we can work on validation. And all we're really going to do right now is just make sure there's a provider for every injectable. So first of all, let's grab all the mono behaviors in the scene. Then let's figure out which ones in this collection actually implement the I dependency provider type. Then let's figure out what dependencies they actually provide. Let's do that in a separate method. So this new method, we can just call get provided dependencies and we'll pass in the providers. Let's return a hash set and okay, Copilot's making a suggestion that actually looks quite good. So we'll just iterate over all the providers. We're gonna find any methods that have the provide attribute. If so, we're going to figure out what the return type of that method was, add the dependency to the list and return it. I'm gonna use some link to do this. So I'll break it down line by line. First of all, for all of these mono behaviors, Let's use select many. This will flatten the list 
And for every mono behavior, we're going to get all of the fields. Now we can project each result into a new object that'll just contain a reference to the mono behavior and one field. Now let's filter those fields down to only the ones that are marked with an inject attribute. Next, we're going to filter it again to find the ones where the type of the field is not contained in the provided dependencies, and the current value of the field in the mono behavior instance is null. Finally, let's transform any results that came out of this into an error message. The message should be able to tell us where it came from, what game object it belonged to, and what the name of the actual field was. So now we have a collection of error messages, and if it's not empty, we should say that there was a problem and say exactly what the problems were. Let's just convert it to a list quickly so it's a little simpler to work with. And then what we could do is say, if there aren't any, meaning there aren't any problems, let's say everything is good. Otherwise, we'll just iterate over it and say, we have problems. Here's each problem one by one. So using link there was optional. You could have also done that with for loops and if statements. I'm going to add one more thing down here. I think we should have a debug message. When we've cleared all dependencies, we should say something in the, in the console. And that's really it. Why don't we go test this out? So right now I've got the dependency, the ability system factory, on the same game object as the injector. Now over on the hero, you can see there's nothing in there yet, but I do have the ability to drag and drop it in there. The icon turns green like we'd expect. If I press play, it should give us a message that it's already set, and yes, it does. We've got a warning there that says the field ability system factory of class hero is already set. So it doesn't replace it with a new service. It just uses the one that's there. Now for further testing, we could just set this to none, but why don't we try out the new button that we made? So if I click clear all injectable fields button, we get a message that says all injectable fields cleared. And if we check the hero, yeah, it's correctly set that field to none. Now, if I press play, of course, it's now going to inject the service that we're looking for. So it's working just as we'd expect, looking good. Uh, let's come out of here and try validating. So if I come back over to the injector class and click validate all dependencies, it says that all dependencies are valid, which is what we'd expect. However, if I was to remove the ability system factory so that we don't have one in the scene and now click it, yes, we have one dependency that's invalid and it tells us exactly where it is. The hero is missing the dependency ability system factory on game object hero. Now, if we add it again, it's going to tell us that it's valid, but I need to check off collapse. There we go. All dependencies are valid. So one more thing before I sign off. I know some people are going to ask about this amazing grass shader that I've been using in my scene. I'm pretty sure this is the best grass shader I've ever seen or worked with. Highly, highly recommended. I'll leave a link to that in the description.